that Benjamin B. Thomas was the author of the best Lincoln Bible, the best single volume Lincoln Bible I've ever written. And, but you probably don't know much more about him. And so we have this evening his daughter Sarah Thomas to tell us about her distinguished father. And let's give a very warm welcome to Sarah Thomas, in part because she has endowed this symposium with a very generous gift for which the Abraham Lincoln Association is deeply grateful. Sarah.
Foreign publishers took note and it was published in 14 languages. Italian, Arabic, Chinese, French, German, Greek, Hebrew, Japanese, Korean, Portuguese, Serbo-Croatian, Slovene, Spanish, and Turkish. In 1980, Brandon House purchased Knopf. Publication of the book continued. The copyright was renewed by my mother, Salome K. Thomas, in 1980. It remains in the possession of my sister, Martha Barthel, and me. And you should see the huge royalties I get. I just got $36 for three months. <laughs> in 1980, Stephen Oates, a respected historian, wrote a Lincoln biography called With Malice Toward None, which was predicted by some to replace the Thomas book as the definitive one-volume Lincoln book. However, in 1990, Robert Bray, are you here, Robert? Okay, here. An English professor at Illinois Wesleyan College noticed some similarities between this book and the Thomas book. Complaints of plagiarism were made to the American Historical Association by Springfield historian Colin Davis. The association concluded that Oates failed to give Mr. Thomas sufficient attribution for the material used. Stephen Oates fought back. He held a news conference at the University of, excuse me, of Massachusetts to deny the charge. He retained a lawyer. Before being informed of this outcome of the investigation by the American Historical Association, he went public saying any two biographies of the same subject will have similarities in facts, sequences, themes, and theories. He also said of Davis's investigation, you are located right in the heart of the enemy where all this nonsense began. But the issue did not end die there. Michael Burlingame steps in, <laughs> then a professor of history at Connecticut College. And he thought Ed Oates got off too lightly. He contacted two scientists, they were government scientists, who had recently developed a computer program which could detect plagiarism. They were uh, eager to use this as a test for their invention. The results were too exacting as it identified phrases such as the balcony of the Tremont House as plagiarism. And there was the question of two government scientists using federal fund, funded research money for this project. They were subsequently reassigned. <laughs> Articles about the heated arguments appeared in the New York Times, Time Magazine, and the Chicago Tribune, and of course, the Illinois State Journal Register. Plagiarism is difficult to prove, and some scholars stated that Oates should have at least credited Thomas's writings with some of the passages in his book. In 1986, a family friend, who was a member of the Book of the Month Club, called my mother to tell her that Abraham Lincoln was an alter alternate section for a month that year in the Book of the Month Club. My mother, who was always more interested in my father's legacy than in dollars, called me to relate the news. I was living in Indiana at the time. I reminded her of the ownership of the copyright and said companies can't just go around printing it without paying. I was amazed the Book of the Month Club, which only reprints other publishers' books, thought they could do this. When I talked to Barry Hines, our attorney, he asked me if I was sure my mother owned the copyright. Look in the introductory pages of the Book of the Month Club version. It says right there, my mother owns the copyright. They just forgot to pay the royalties. A letter from Barry Hines prompted a check to my mother. Then years later, my son found the entire text online, which was done without our permission. This was done by Grolier, a subsidiary of Scholastic, and a company called Questia. Eventually, Random House gave bookseller Barnes & Noble the right to print their own copy of the book and include it in their classic book series. The arrangement was to last five years. In 2007, I received an email from Sean Yule at Random
Random House, saying, Barnes & Noble have only recently informed me that there is declining interest in their editions of the book. Therefore, they do not wish to renew the reprint license. He continued, I have checked with Vintage Books, our paperback imprint, and Random House Value, publisher of the inexpensive hardcover editions, and both have decided to pass on the opportunity to reissue the book. This was right before Lincoln's 200th birthday. I called Mr. Hewell. You can't do this now, I exclaimed. Lincoln's 200th birthday is coming up. This book cannot go out of print at this time. Mr. Ewell was patient and polite, but I could imagine what he was thinking. This lady wants me to continue publication of this book, which has a copyright of 1952, just because it is about Lincoln, and was written by her daddy, about, about whom I have no knowledge, I have never heard of him or his work. There ensued many phone conversations and emails over several months. My arguments were not changing the minds of the people at Random House. One day, in the midst of these discussions, I received a package. Inside were four beautiful, hardbound copies of Abramo Lincoln, the book in Italian. I informed Random House, thinking this might change their minds. However, they were only concerned with getting their just due from the Italians. Mr. Yule kindly suggested I might try the university press. I agreed with him and wrote, now that the book is essentially out of publication, except in Italy, I will pursue that. Again, I spoke to Barry Hines, my attorney, who has been through all my trials and tribulations for years. I think he's a member of ALA. He reminded me that the Southern Illinois University Press was still printing my father's first book, Lincoln's New Salem. I contacted Sylvia Rodriguez, acquisitions editor at SIU Press, and said basically this, and, and received basically the same response that I had received from Random House. Why should they print a 1952 book just because the author's daughter wanted to keep it in print. Why was this book deserving of continuing publication? In spite of her obvious reservations, she asked me if I had any reviews I could send her. That was not a problem, as my mother had said everything about my dad in two very large scrapbooks. I sent a few of the best. She then asked if I could get three Lincoln scholars to say the book was significant and should be kept in print. That was not a problem either, as every February 12th that Springfield goes all out for its most famous president's birthday, Lincoln scholars abound. I attended the Abraham Lincoln Association dinner and in about 10 minutes had the necessary endorsements. <laughs> that convinced her and SIU Press agreed to reissue the book in paperback form with an introduction by Michael Burlingame. The book remained, and it looks like, <coughs> this is the last, the SIU book. I'm showing you that for a reason. <laughs> the book remains in print by SIU Press. It is mostly forgotten by the casual reader of Lincoln's life. The true scholars, however, still revere it. Not too long ago, while at an Abraham Lincoln Association's Lincoln Birthday Banquet, I sat next to a gentleman I had never met. He asked me about my connection to Lincoln. When I told him my father was Benjamin P. Thomas, he was quite surprised. He said, I can't believe I am sitting next to Benjamin Thomas' daughter. Bob Lenz, <laughs> I told you I'm going to include you wherever he is. Bob, that was you. Um, Lincoln scholars are not the only people who admire and use the book. Several college English professors have told me that they use the book in their English courses as an example of good writing. James Hurt, an English professor, spoke at a ceremony at the Illinois State Library honoring my dad's memory. He spoke of the book from a literary point of view. He read a passage from the book as an example and then closed his speech by saying, this is the poetry of short sentences 
a beautifully tactful, understated prose that allows events to generate their own emotions without verbal straining or excess. This is an eloquent exp expression of the sentiment I hear to this day. I recently visited Washington, D.C., as some of you know, <laughs> and went to Ford's Theater. Across the street, next to the Peterson House, where Lincoln died, is the Center for Education and Leadership. The center is used to, for exhibits to preserve Lincoln's legacy and serves as a resource center for teachers. In the foyer, a 34-foot stack of Lincoln books meant, meant to demonstrate to the public how many books have been written about our 16th president. I decided to look for Abraham Lincoln by Benjamin P. Thomas. I didn't have to look far. It was the very, at the very top of the tower. Thank you. If Lincoln were still alive, today would be his 210th birthday. He's remembered for leading the nation through the Civil War, abolishing slavery, and preserving the Union. People from around the country are traveling to Springfield today to visit the Lincoln sites. And although Lincoln was born in Kentucky, Illinois has coined the land of Lincoln. He rode the 8th Judicial Circuit as an attorney, and, and so he traveled a lot through this area and got to know the people of this area very well, and they have got to know him. And that was really, uh, it was this area that shaped Lincoln and the man who the nation got to know as President of the United States. The city of Springfield is offering free parking downtown today, so no need to plug the meters if you go visit the events.